Good morning, team meet, and welcome to our latest commander's call. I'm your public affairs officer, Chad Jones, and today we're going to get some garrison updates and recognize some of our great teammates. If you do have questions during today's presentation, please email them to chad, C-H-A-D dot T dot Jones dot Civ at Army dot Mill. Uh, as we go through today, we're going to get an update from our garrison commander. That's going to be followed up by an update by our deputy garrison commander. Then we're going to present some awards, and then finally we'll get to your questions and answers. So again, keep those questions coming, and then we'll we'll work on getting them through. We're going to be live. Uh, we have the feed until 11:30, so you know until the questions are going, or up until 11:30, we'll be here. So a lot going on. Still cold, sir. I thought you could control that by now, but. Uh, uh, other than that, it is my pleasure to introduce our garrison commander, Colonel Nyland. I think we got to talk to the chat, but I don't, think I'm, I don't get to be in control of that, Chad. So, hey, um, Chris Nyland, you're garrison commander, right? How many times have I said that lately? Um, hey, for the new team members, most, most people know and understand where I'm coming from, but for the new team members, um, this is one of the most important events that I do on a regular reoccurring basis for a couple of reasons. One, and most importantly, is because we get to recognize the performance of some of the great teammates and some of the great um, and some of our great mission partners, um, and that's super important to me personally. Second is is because I get to answer your question because um, I know a lot of times there's things out there that are bubbling up uh, inside the organization. There's things people want to know about. We've already got some questions. Uh, but I like to make sure that we can kind of uh, level the bubbles, keep everyone informed, and really try to address anything, any concerns that the team may have um, out there uh, in an upfront, honest way. And finally, the third one is, is this an opportunity to provide some information, some command information, some things about what's going on going on around the installation and uh, and what we see coming up in the future. Um, and again, that that idea is is everyone works better um when they're well equipped with information um and that's the point of this so um first and foremost before we get started on any of that um i want you know i, I know i tend to sound like a broken records occasionally but i want to thank everyone for the hard work and effort that they've been putting in um we're, as we start to come out of the winter season um as the um age of covid uh enters a a lull period, it is not lost on me at all how much hard work and effort the entire team has been investing into this installation and investing into our customers and to our mission partners uh, to enable them to accomplish some of their uh, critical national security missions. Um, since the last time we've been together, um, there's been some things going on over in Europe, right? Um, you know, I often talk to the uh, to the leadership uh, external to uh, Fort Meade, um, I try to give them examples of of why Fort Meade is important and why what we do here is absolutely critical. Um, and I don't know if if all of you noticed, um, but the day that well, really the weeks, even the weeks leading up to um, the Russian in invasion of Ukraine, um, if you noticed. Uh, the vast majority of the teams that work behind the fence went to 12, 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. Okay. And they maintain that for about uh, a month and a half. And even today, uh, they're working some very extended hours because the work that's going on behind the fence over there on the NSA compound is directly contributing to the decision making of um, our senior leaders in the government. So they're directly contributing to the decision making of the president, secretary of defense, et cetera. And they're also in direct uh, contact uh, with forces that want to work against our national interests. So whether that's protecting our own networks or doing uh, or or helping uh, allies and partners shore up their networks or uh, or taking other actions in support of our national security interests, that work is going on. Um, the front line for America's support to the Ukraine and what's going on over in Europe is right here on Fort Meade. 
Um, and the work that we do to support those organizations, the work that we do to support those service members uh, enables them to stay focused on that mission and to protect our national interests. And so I want to thank each and every one of you, each and every member of this team, uh, regardless of what you do on a day to day basis, you are making a difference and you're directly contributing uh, to national security by supporting our customers and supporting our mission partners. And I don't think and I think it's important that we not lose that we don't lose that um, that connection to what's going on, um, not only in the world, but uh, right here, the, right here and how we impact that here on Fort Meade. Um, OK, so a couple updates for everyone. Um, you know me, I've got to start with COVID, so I'm going to start with COVID. Um, most of you may have already seen, but the Department of Defense has issued. Basically, they rescinded all of their previous COVID guidance and published all brand new guidance. And so, okay, so what? What does that mean to us? The biggest takeaway for, for us is that um, under the new standards um, for DOD, um, they've changed how we calculate the health protection condition, so the HPCON level. Um, and they basically tied it directly to the new standards that the Centers for Disease Control use to um, rate risk in local communities. All of you know that we closely track our five surrounding counties. Um, I'm going to name them off, and I always screw it up. Howard, Anne Arundel, Montgomery, Prince George, and Baltimore County. We track them very closely, and right now all five of those counties are in low uh, transmission risk. That's why we um, rescinded the mask mandate. That's what allowed us to rescind that mask mandate. Under the new DOD policy, they've tied HPCON level to the risk level in those five surrounding counties. So technically right now we are in a position um, where I could recommend to the senior commander that we move from HPCON Bravo to HPCON Alpha. What does that mean? If we were to move to HPCON Alpha, we'd be able to remove uh, many of the occupancy restrictions um, and we'd be able to reduce a number of our mitigation measures across the installation. So there's probably a bunch of you either in the room or online right now that are going, well, why haven't we done that yet? Come on, what are you waiting for, sir? Um, well, here's what I'm waiting for. So um, while everyone's been celebrating uh, not wearing masks, and I know the, the recent, uh, even the, the transportation mask mandate has been knocked down, we've continued to watch the COVID numbers in the surrounding area. Seen as we've seen a pattern over the last six weeks of increasing numbers of new cases in the surrounding area. Now they haven't yet gotten to the point where they've pushed the threshold uh, for, for the CDC level of low to medium, but they're headed in that direction right now. And unfortunately what we've seen over the past six weeks is the rate of increase is going up. So while we saw like it started out with like a 1% increase and then we saw a 5% increase, Last week we saw a 23% increase. And so what, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see a curve go like this rather than just a slow increase. Um, and that is what's caused me to pause um, seeking permission to move to HPCon Alpha. Um, most of you know I've made the I made made the commitment throughout my entire time here to move slow and deliberately to make sure that we're not jerking our population around with changing. Uh, with massive changes in mitigation measures. And that's my concern is that if we were to go to the senior commander today and go, hey, we want to move to HPCon Alpha, here in just a couple of weeks, we'll end up having to go back to Bravo. Um, so what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a slowing or a leveling out of the increase in cases um, before I go back to the commander and, uh, and ask him to move to HPCon Alpha. Um, but in the interim, what I've asked all the... Uh, all the directors to do and all the managers to do is for our customer facing uh, portions of the installation is to go back and refresh once again what measures we would take if we moved to HPCon Alpha. And I anticipate making that decision here um, in the next uh, in the next two weeks. OK, so Ditmas has already got a mark on the wall of when they're going to put together a decision brief. Um, and then we'll look and based on what we're seeing with the data at that time, we'll go to the senior commander and make our recommendation of which way we should head. So um, if you if if I'm, I'm more than welcome or I'm more than willing to answer any questions you may have around that. Um, the other thing that I will tell you that has occurred recently is that a. Um, uh, for most of you. Um, 
it doesn't impact very much of our workforce, but there, but there was a suspension of the um, federal workforce vaccination mandate uh, because it was challenged in a court, and they put it up. They put in an injunction uh, in the in court. That injunction has subsequently been vacated um, by a court of appeals, and so right now, um, the uh, right now OPM and subsequently DOD and subsequently Army are working through the processes of what the, vaca the vacating of that injunction means and how we're going to continue forward with not only um, the, uh, the vaccine mandate, but the potential consequences for those that choose not to take the vaccine that don't have a, um, a uh, protected exemption request uh, in place. So. Uh, more to follow on that, but that but that has occurred recently. And and as you know, as those things happen at the federal level, it takes a little while to trickle down through the uh, through the different processes to tell us how we're moving out on that. Um, OK, so that's COVID. Um, something that I know is near to dear on near and dear to many people's heart that's out there. I'm going to go into my DPW block and I got team DPW up there to help me answer any questions. But um, I know near and dear to everyone's heart. Um, two weeks ago or one week ago, it was my goodness, sir, when are we turning on the air conditioning? Um, and you know, then the temperatures tanked this week. And now, uh, if you had your air conditioning turned on or your heat turned off, now everyone's like, well, why isn't the heat working? Okay. So the vast majority of the installation has not converted over from heat to AC. And that is a deliberate decision based off of. Uh, the standard that we typically use, which is 10 consecutive days of temperatures above 50 degrees. Um, you know, you, we're looking out at the weather predictions and we're continuing to see temperatures uh, fluctuate wildly. And so we don't intend to turn over the vast majority of the um, HVAC systems to heat until we start to see or to air conditioning until we start to see consistent temperatures above 50 degrees. There have been a handful of critical facilities that were turned over to AC already. Uh, for example, the centers, the CDCs were turned over um, and the barracks were turned over. And that's because, and the reason why we chose to do that was because um, by the end of the month, I know many of you have heard this before, but by the end of the month, we, we anticipate seeing the award of our new base ops contract. With the award of any new contract, uh, there's a lot of turbulence in that period. And what we wanted to make sure is that for the critical facilities like the CDCs, the barracks, uh, places like that, that we had the HVAC uh, turnover complete and it wouldn't be disrupted by the change in the base ops contract. Um, the other thing that we're anticipating to see with the base ops contract is we're anticipating a number of our um, regular teammates that we work with over at Melwood may choose to um, depart um, to leave Melwood when the base ops contract turns over. Uh, that's Melwood internal business, and we don't have a lot to do with that, um, but it may mean um, uh, potential disruption as they bring in new personnel and we start to build relationships with them. And as we both and as both sides of that contract kind of work out what this new contract means to Fort Meade. Um, this is, uh, there's only, I think, uh, this will be the third installation that's ever gone to this type of contract. Um, and we're kind of, we're a little bit of a pilot test bed. Um, so there's gonna be some growing pains and I expect um, that there will be some challenges uh, this summer into the fall as both sides kind of figure out how this new contract is going to work. Um, so I do ask for people's patience. What I don't want you to do is to put off putting in work orders. If you see something wrong in your facilities, if you see something wrong in common areas, um, if you see something, you know, you know, the, 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 the uh, force protection guys are going to hate me. If you see something, say something. If you see something, put in the work order. OK, we all have we all own a piece of this base um, and we all want to want this base uh, to be to represent you know, the, um, um, uh, to be, we all want as much pride in, the, to have as much pride in this base as we have in our own work and our own work groups. And part of that is the appearance and upkeep, upkeep of the installation. So please, if you see something, put in the work order. Um, even if we start to see delay, delays or disruption on work order, 
uh, execution, we want to make sure those work orders are in, so we're putting the demand on the new base ops contract. Did I miss anything up there on that DPW? Okay. Um, okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, from a DPW perspective, just because it impacts so many of us, is um, I have, uh, we've earmarked um, nearly one and a half million dollars uh, for this spring, summer, and fall that we're putting into infrastructure repair. So that means roads, striping, signs, and traffic control. Um, and we've already begun doing that work. Many of you have probably already driven over the work and didn't even notice it because, uh, because the problem isn't there anymore. But um, some of the things that we're going to be doing with this money is uh, we're going to repave the strip of MAPES that basically goes from uh, English Street to Rose Street. So right there in front of the commissary, um, that whole area that's pretty rough that didn't get addressed when we did the MAPES 175 gate. We're going to repave that completely. In the interim, if you've driven that recently, you've noticed we went in and we um, and we filled in all the potholes in that area, um, and that's preparatory works for when we come through and we we repave that strip later on this year. Some other things that we're going to do, um, you're going to see base wide restriping on roads and parking lots. So, for example, when you go to the PX now, rather than just kind of guessing where the parking space is, there'll actually be stripes to kind of guide you into where to park at the PX. Uh, you'll see that at the PX, the shop at, and a number of different uh, parking spaces and roads around the post. Uh, um, DPW owes me a base-wide signage upgrade before the end of July. Um, so you're going to see improvement. You're going to see uh, we're going to pull down some of the old um, uh, uh, aged signage around here. We're going to replace it with new signs, um, again, because uh, it's a lot of times the signage on an installation is the first impression that visitors and new people uh, take away from. Um, we're going to upgrade two traffic lights. So the traffic light at Mapes and MacArthur and the traffic light at MacArthur and Ruffner, those two right there in the town center um, that are really hard to see, especially uh, in the early morning hours. Um, those lights are going to get new LED light upgrades to make them uh, visible and make sure that, that those are working. We're putting in six new flashing crosswalks for uh, pedestrian traffic that needs to cross MAPES north to south. And we're redoing the sidewalk along MAPES from the Dinfos uh, schoolhouse area, the exchange right there by Dinfos School, all the way out to Cooper Road so that those students that kind of beat that trail almost um, every day on the weekend and even some days during the week, they're going to be able to do so safely on a sidewalk rather than kind of walking through the grass, et cetera. And then you're going to see additional handicap spaces. Um, we did the analysis of several parking lots around the installation. We're going to be installing some additional handicap spaces for those parking lots that that need them that we've identified. Uh, did I miss anything? All the major ones. OK, um, so those are all planned upgrades in and, and really in and while I'm very proud of the of the money we've been able to dedicate to this effort and the work that DPW is do has already started. What I'm actually even more proud of is um, we've established some systems and processes to so that we will see consistent investment in those areas um, over time. So rather than waiting for things to get really, really bad and us having to throw a lot of money at it, um, the way that we're doing the SRM budget now is we've built out a special category for roads, striping, signage, and every every year that category is going to get some funding. So we're going to be able to, once we get it up to a level that we're proud of, we're going to be able to maintain it year over year and super proud of the work that DPW has been doing on that. Um, I saw a question, I, I, I took a peek at some of the questions coming in ahead of time, and I saw one of the questions was, Someone had asked about a, um, a uh, an update on the Reese Road project. So um, I'm going to be honest. When we when we originally uh, when we originally closed Reese Road, we had an estimate of when we thought it was going to be reopened. Um, and I deliberately told everyone, don't tell anyone that estimate because we know there's going to be delays. Um, you just I mean, 
for any of you that have spent any time out in the garrison, you know, Milcon projects, there are always delays with Milcon projects. And so I think from the beginning, I, I told everyone a hey, plan for the summer of 23 uh, for Reese to be reopened. And I think we're on track for the summer of 23 right now, right? Yeah. There have been some delays out at Reese, primarily revolving around meeting some of the requirements of the Maryland Department of Environment, which is okay. The Maryland Department of Environment, as, as challenging as they are to work with occasionally, they're doing great work um, in keeping the state of Maryland uh, green and clean and keeping the Chesapeake Bay clean. And so uh, we've been working through some issues with them or the, our contractors been working through some issues, issues with them, but we are still on track for summer of 23. It's going to be a long and extended project, but um, um, but everything's moving forward uh, without any big issues right now. Um, okay, so happy to answer any questions on any of that stuff. If you've got them coming up, I'm going to, I've got a uh, couple more subjects I want to touch on real briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Foley. So um, one of them is budget. Um, so for those folks that pay attention to the budget stuff, hey, Congress passed our budget a couple months ago. What are our numbers, right? Um, well, we've just started getting some of the preliminary numbers from IMCOM and IDS, and we're working through them right now. So I don't have a so what for you right now on what the budget's going to look like. Um, but what I am going to tell you is what I consistently tell you. If you need something um, in your workplaces, if you need something to get your job done, um, put in the request up through the system, and we are we are spending money every month on stuff that people need to get their work done. There is no spending freeze. There is no, I, I don't want, I don't want any of the sections or directorates or teams out there to be making, to, to be making um, uh, self-limiting cuts. Hey, we're not going to, we know that there's no money, so we're not, we need this, but we're not going to put it in. That's not true. There is money. If you need something, if you need something to get your job done, put in the request. Um, all those go up uh, through RM to Mr. Foley, and he's making decisions on a regular basis and spending money. Okay. Um, I think we've spent, I saw the number earlier today. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but we've spent, We've spent a good amount of money already this year, and we are continuing to spend for those things that we need to spend. I mean, Chief Alvarez, you've got, what, four police officers in the police academy right now? Okay, that's money that we're spending right now because uh, the police uh, the police department needs those needs us to spend those money so they can get their job done. Um, so we, we will continue to spend money. Um, I don't need I don't want any of you worrying about that. Let us worry about that. What I do and what I do not anticipate changing for the remainder of this year is is um, is how we manage money. OK, I think from what I'm seeing right now for the remainder of this year, we're going to continue to have to centrally manage money at the headquarters um, rather than distributing out budgets like we have done previously. Um, I don't think. I think we've managed to prove that we can do that successfully over the last couple of years. I'm interested in your feedback if there is concerns about how we've been doing that. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about right now is um, is what we've been calling the PCS stance effort. OK, um, you've heard me talk about it before. Um, we did not have a great PCS season last year. There were a lot of uh, delays in soldiers receiving orders in transportation appointments um, across the board. There were a number of delays. Um, last year was the busiest PCS season in in memory here at Fort Meade. Um, this year, we it is um, it is highly likely it is going to be ten percent busier this year than it was last year. Okay, so most of you know that we've made some deliberate efforts very early on to make sure that we approach this PCS season well prepared, and uh, between our teammates at DHR, LRC. Uh, housing and our, our Kimbro teammates and our ACS teammates working EFMP, I think we've done a good job of making sure that we are ready for the season, that we've got some systems and processes in place in order to help it, uh, inform chains of command in order for them to help us help their soldiers. And we've done, we've made some, um, a multitude of different 
uh, process improvements and resource allocations to make sure that we're ready to handle an increased demand on those services. That being said, um, this PCS season is going to be challenged by a number of factors, not only the volume, but also um, there's some challenges in the uh, in the transportation side of the house, kind of outside the military's control based on economy hiring and uh, being able to hire truck drivers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're, I, I'm, I, I'm not in a position where I can promise every soldier an absolute smooth sail through the PCS season, um, but I am in the position where I can promise them that we're doing everything possible that we can control to make sure their, their, um, their transition is smooth. Um, so what does that mean for us? So right now we're, I'd say, Wes, correct me if I'm wrong, I'd say right now we're in the beginning of the PCS season. We're in the early, early months. Is that right? Okay. Okay. So late beginning, let's, let's split the difference. Okay. We're in the late beginnings of, of the PCS season. Um, and right now what we've seen is we've seen that we can, we're managing the flow pretty well right now through the four major processes. Um, I will tell you from my perspective, our ability to take care of soldiers and families that are PCSing this summer is our number one priority going into this season. Okay. Um, and so what does that mean to everyone not involved in that effort? That means that um, if we see challenges in that effort and we need to apply more resources to those areas that we will potentially be coming to other folks saying, hey, we need to temporarily reprioritize resources, whether those are man hours, whether those are, are, are dollars, whatever, to support the PCS uh, transition. What it also means is as we all go about our daily businesses and we tend to um, interact or cross over directorate lines or we have things that we need from other people is DHR, LRC, ACS, they're prioritizing PCS season. So that means that some actions that you need, need out of them may be slowed or delayed because their priority is firmly fixed on taking care of those soldiers and families. Um, alternatively, um, if you have things going on in your areas that will potentially impact that, the, their ability to do that, we may have to delay those things in your areas in order to allow them to stay focused on the PCS season, okay? And so again, really interested in any questions anyone may have on that. Um, but I want to just, I wanted to make sure everyone understands where our priority is, and that's taking care of those soldiers and families who are in transition over this, over this season. Okay. So with that, I want to turn it over to, uh, Mr. Foley real quick. I know he's got a few things he wants to, or he's got to cover and, uh, sir, I was just going to mention, we got a lot of information that just came from you. Mr. Foley's about ready to get some. So I just wanted to remind everybody watching that if you have questions, we're still taking them. It's Chad dot t dot jones dot civ at army dot mil send those in so we can get those up uh, we're about halfway through the program now so just want to get that reminder out there and with that mr foley okay thanks uh, sir thanks chad appreciate it very much and good morning to all on uh, and our great team at mead so appreciate everyone that's here today and everyone that's viewing out there via uh via teams and, and media so just want to first foot stomp um, the the bosses, the colonels' uh, point on on spending money. We are absolutely spending money. We will continue to spend money needed to function and to operate. Uh, um, and I do review the monthly purchase requests that come up from you all, but I am doing a good deep dive review on them all and asking questions. If I have questions on the justification for the purchase requirements, so I I know and we are all collectively uh, um, working to ensure that we are using every dollar, spending every dollar, and gaining the maximum efficiency and effectiveness out of every dollar spent. So I'm asking all of you, you know, the concepts of, of making sure that if the purchase request is coming up, it is 100% valid, you know you need it, 
You've done everything you can to maximize utility of the resources that you had. They are completely used up and spent, um, and now we need more. And we will continue to, uh, of course, support and spend the money that's needed. So thanks to everyone for being fiscally irresponsible and using every dollar as effectively as we possibly can. Um, the first task that the commander gave me when I reported in, uh, almost the very first thing was he showed me the, the leadership board um, at the on the second floor there, the garrison headquarters building, and you come up the stairs and he showed me all the vacancies and he said, task number one, deputy garrison commander is fill this board with pictures. And so that has been my number one priority here for these first uh, four or five months that I've been on the ground. Um, we've made great progress collectively. We continue to make great progress in, in uh, filling the board with uh, new names and faces. And I want to thank everyone that's helped me in this effort to get new key leaders uh, on board. And, and we are continuing to do so. So just a highlight of a few of the key leaders that have joined us key transitions that have taken place over the uh, over the past few months. First, we brought on board now about a month and a half, two months ago, Ms. Ivy Merrick as our new director of Equal Employment Opportunity uh, in the office. So, uh, uh, Ivy, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. She comes to us from uh, uh, Army Test and Evaluation Command at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Very, very uh, highly recommended and a, and a great uh, long many years of experience in multiple army units in equal oppor in employment opportunity. Uh, so Ivy's making a great impact already and we're thankful for her being on the team. Uh, right behind uh, getting Ms. Merrick on board was uh, filling the resource management officer position after Mr. Sandre Mann retired and uh, Danielle Miner fortunately for all of us applied for the position and and was selected. So congratulations and public recognition to Danielle Miner for now assuming uh, the director role of our resource management office after working in our resource management office for a long, long, <laughs> long time. <laughs> so yeah, probably the easiest uh, interview that uh, that I had to go through and uh, will have to go through in my tenure was, was getting Ms. Danielle uh, hired into the director position. So great news there. Uh, Next in line and, and our most recent addition up in, uh, in the command group uh, is Miss Megan Rice. Megan is here with us um, this afternoon in the middle row there. She's taking over as the management support officer uh, position in the front office, uh, working with Miss Lorraine. Um, and I want to thank publicly Miss Lorraine Kelly for covering down in our front office as a one woman show for uh, um, at least six months or so, I guess, since uh, Wes came in and stole Paul Hathaway from uh, from the boss and brought him to DHR. And so <laughs> um, Megan is taking over what is uh, arguably the second most powerful position on the garrison staff as the keeper of the commander's uh, schedule and calendar. Uh, but she also comes to us highly qualified from the uh, Army CP29 Fellowship Program. Uh, coming to us from uh, Fort Gordon most recently, which was working as part of the fellowship program. And so Megan is joining us and she's going to be uh, not just working the, the, the boss's schedule, but also helping us improve processes, um, uh, streamlining the garrison battle rhythm, helping uh, uh, me reestablish a hiring board process um, uh, and awards board processes for the for the installation as a whole. So Megan's going to be very busy here uh, as she finishes getting on board here in the next few weeks, taking over the role. So thanks for joining us, Megan. And um, uh, so next coming on board here in the in uh, next Monday reporting for duty is Mr. David Engel, who is taking over uh, as the garrison safety officer from Mr. Kirk Vector. Kirk is on his retirement uh, leave right now. Um, so uh, I also want to publicly thank Ms. Janelle Ferguson. Janelle, I hope you're out there listening in uh, because Janelle has been doing yeoman's work also here over the past two or three months because both Aaron and Tony, our other longstanding GS-12 employees in the safety office, decided that they were going to retire at the same time as Kirk. 
so I, uh, I uh, applaud them for, uh, for their long years of service, but uh, Janelle's had to cover down. She's done, an, again, uh, just an awesome job covering for them. We've got all three of those GSO positions filled. Mr. Engel reports on Monday, and then we have both of those GS-12 positions also uh, filled, and we have uh, entry and duty dates for both of those employees who will be joining us here by the end of May. Um, so big transition in the Garrison Safety Office with Ms. Janelle holding down the fort there. Um, right behind Mr. Engel coming on board is uh, our new uh, inf uh, information management officer working uh, on the gar in the Garrison Command Group with Mr. Mike Steele. Uh, Mr. Corey Cooley will be reporting on 8 May to join Mike. So um, no one's happier than Mike Steele to have a, to have a a uh, second person to help him out in all of the hard work that Mike is doing uh, as the IMO to try to work our automation needs uh, as best as we possibly can. So uh, it was a that was one of the key uh, efforts that we needed to to work on to improve IT mm -hmm. services and in, in, in the installation was num number one get a second person to help with the effort to help Mike in that effort. And so we've accomplished that. Mr. Cooley will be on board here soon. Um, and then last but not least, I want to recognize uh, that the Colonel and I have selected Mr. Chris Thiel to serve as the um, Director of Operations for the installation, which is the new name that IDS has given to the to the uh, Director of Plans, Training, Mobilization, Security. So uh, Chris is still going through the, uh, um, uh, our CPAC is still working to extend Chris his final job offer, so we're in between tentative and final with Mr. Thiel, um, but we're confident he's going to make it across the finish line here in the next uh, next few weeks, and we'll get uh, Chris permanently into the director of operations position. Uh, still working on three other key uh, in, uh, key positions to fill. The, uh, uh, the uh, Garrison XO position, uh, also up in the command group, um, working to get that position here announced. Uh, in the next few days, uh, and then also working on uh, the PIO director position to get that position announced. I want to thank Mr. Uh, 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 Sa Javed for covering down also as our acting director in PIO for the past uh, few months. And um, he's going to have to hold the fort down for a little while longer because we've permanently stolen Mr. Thiel from PIO to, uh, to director of operations. Um, and of course, the director of public works position. So we're still working on that director position and um, want to publicly thank Lieutenant Colonel Solizano up in the back row up there for covering down on the DPW position for um, the past several months. Rob's been doing a great job covering down. So we are continuing to work hiring actions very hard. It is a huge team effort to do so. Um, collectively, we have achieved an onboard strength now of, of just over 90% which I understand is the first time we've uh, we've been able to achieve that in Colonel Nyland's tenure here, um, and it's been quite a while. So there is a big collective effort across the entire board um, with all supervisors, hiring managers, um, and in particular, Ms. Amber Petronio, who is our civilian personnel. <laughs> no question that Amber gets a round of applause from us all because she helps us all in our hiring actions, not just me, not just the Colonel. Um, and Amber does an absolute bang up job as our civilian personnel uh, liaison between all of us and CPAC, um, translating all of the challenges with CPAC rules and regulations when hiring so that those of us that are lay people in that can understand and and uh, and use the system to its greatest effect. So thanks, Amber, for all of your hard work and everything you do. Um, OK. IT support. Uh, still continues to be a priority effort for uh, for myself and for us all. Um, and so just understand that we are continuing to work uh, the challenges and the issues involved. Uh, as I said, first piece was to get get Mike Steele cloned. So he has a second person to to help out all of the offices and directorates that uh, that are uh, do not have organic uh, IMOs. Um, uh, so doing that, the per life cycle purchase of a 100 new laptops, um, the money has been paid for. The laptops have been paid for, money's been paid. 
Uh, IDS is centralizing the procurement action, so that they've got the money, they're they are moving out on the procurement action, and so we're hopeful that uh, computers will be will be on hand here by mid late summer. Um, we're not doing the hiring action ourselves. I mean the uh, procurement action ourselves, so we have a little bit less control, but um, but there's benefit in centralizing all the purchases at the higher level for all the cost savings uh, that can be reaped and such. So um, IDS is moving out on that procurement. New laptops will be here soon. Um, so directors, office uh, uh, office managers and directors, please make sure that Mr. Steele has your prioritized list uh, within your organizations, the highest priority of computers that you're going to need life cycled positionally within your organizations. So as we make the top level prioritization decisions, we get your input, we know what you need and what's highest priority for each of you. Um, Mike's been working very hard on reannouncing the copier contract uh, for, for the installation. So that will be reannounced here soon, life cycling our copy machines um, and also ensuring that we are getting uh, tools out in the most efficient and effective manner that we possibly can so that we all have the automation needed. Make sure your directorates have have installation, have IMOs appointed um, uh, on orders uh, as additional duties. So make sure that you, you know who your IMO is for your local office or division or shop. Um, they are your first point of contact for submission of work orders, working with the NEC. Um, Mike Steele and Mr. Cooley will be kind of that next level of support. Um, but you have to rely first on your organic IMOs in your in your organization. So make sure you know who they are, work with them, um, and then raise up the chain if you have if you have work order prioritization requirements that you don't feel are being are being worked on by the NEC or you need emphasis on those. The NEC, trust me, is responsive to any uh, any requests for prioritization that have made it up to my level. When I reach out to the NEC director and the NEC leadership, they respond quickly and they have been prioritizing. So keep the information flow going. Do not accept. Do not accept it's been a month. Do not accept it's been longer than it, than you think it needs to. Um, don't just sit back and try to find a workaround yourself. Raise the issue up the chain so we can address it and we can work with NEC leadership to prioritize our requirements. So appreciate your effort in that. And then last but not least, and most importantly, make sure you know what you need to be doing to properly care for your automation equipment that's assigned to you personally. Know how to properly care for your computer, your workstation, um, just like a, a soldier knows how to properly care for their assigned weapon, how to keep a clean and functional uh, at all times. And most importantly, when it's when it comes to our computers, it's making sure that they're staying connected to the network every couple of days so that they are receiving the the patch pushes from the neck. Um, it's primarily when computers have been disconnected from the network for a longer period of time. Um, if they miss key patches, then they then become subject to quarantine once they get back on. So if you know collectively that you have a coworker or an employee, uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be out of the net for an extended period of time for whatever reason. Make sure you have someone assigned to make sure that that laptop is being connected to the network. Anybody can stick a cat card in and get it connected, get it logged in and get it connected. And so that is pulling those patches so that when that person comes back from extended absence for whatever reason, they don't come back to a quarantined workstation. So helping ourselves is always going to be the uh, the number one first line of effort to make sure that our computers and automation equipment get up. And then it's just extending and making sure that leadership, myself and Colonel Island are aware of your needs and we will do our absolute best to meet them. Um, last but not least, and I'll turn over here uh, to the next event on the agenda is a reminder to all on uh, evaluations, DP map evaluations for civilian personnel. Uh, so your um, fiscal year 23 appraisals, uh, um, excuse me, performance plans. Wes is going to get me to get that terminology straight someday. Your 23 performance plans are due by 30 April for all. So 
um, supervisors, make sure you are working to get performance elements uh, uh, in place in DP map with all of your employees. Uh, make sure those elements are smart um, with the emphasis on measurable so that those elements can be used to truly uh, quantify performance at the end of the rating period. Uh, so working on 23 performance plans first and then 22 appraisals. The suspense for uh, completion of all 22 appraisals is one June. So we actually have to knock out the, the 23 plans first and then turn our attention to the 22 appraisals and get them knocked out. Directors, please put emphasis uh, down at all levels within your organizations to make sure we get that accomplished. And I'll be digging in on my first deep dive directorate by directorate status during command and staff next Tuesday morning or my staff call next Tuesday morning, not the commander's command. And staff. OK. Um, that's my updates for now, and I'll turn it back over to Chad here as our MC, and we'll drive on with the agenda. And we get to the fun part. We do. Part. Go Cowboys, Mr. Foley. So Whoa. enjoy that. So yes, now we do get Seriously? to to get to Seriously? the. Uh, of course. Seriously. Uh, that goes deep, sir. Seriously. It's been a while. Uh, that's right. Okay. That's right. Um, are there any other cowboy fans out there? I just want to know who you are. Not that appraisals yeah, are coming up or anything. But I'm just, uh, mm, really? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. The only one that matters. All right. So yes, we are getting to the awards presentation. I saw Sergeant Major go first. Sergeant Major, we're going to go with the soldiers first, and then we'll go to the length of service after. So, if PFC Jacob Jackson, Specialist Seth Brenecki, Staff Sergeant James Travis, Specialist Larry Francis, and Specialist Lyle Turner can please come up to the stage. These five outstanding soldiers are getting recognized. You know, the, the great thing about a live event is that we don't always get every. What's your first name, Specialist Pulte? Chance Pulte. All right. These six outstanding service members are all receiving a certificate of appreciation for commitment. This has got to be. For commitment to mission accomplishment and selfless service in support of the sixth annual Fort Meade Illuminating the Darkness Walk for Suicide Awareness and Prevention on 24 September 2021. These soldiers' efforts per personally contributed to the successful completion of an installation wide celebration of life event. Their immediate engagement by, by providing support with the movement of heavy equipment was impeccable. Their stewardship and personal personifies the true spirit of a dedicated leader and their untiring effort reflects great credit upon themselves the 302nd signal battalion fort george g meade and the united states army signed colonel christopher m nyland colonel infantry commanding Hey, uh, real quick before I let these guys go. Um, one, thanks for listening to us um, pontificate about the garrison and stuff. There's, I, I always think it's funny. Usually, uh, usually, anytime the army recognizes soldiers, we always punish them for a little bit ahead of time, and they either they have to show up for the rehearsal to the rehearsal for the award ceremony or something else. We just never make it so it's like really smooth and easy to be recognized. It's not about right, Sergeant Travis. Yeah. Hey, um, I just want to talk about these guys real quick. Please stand at ease, guys. Um, I just want to talk about these guys real quick because. Um, um, this was this recognition was a long time coming. This we were recognizing them for something that happened back in September. Uh, if you remember the Illuminating the Darkness walk, um, it was a really awesome event. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think. I, I mean, I was out there for probably about four hours that night. That was about right. Um, but it was a really awesome event that really um, that really shed uh, some positive light, connect uh, service members um, from across all the services. And, uh, and, and these guys 
um, volunteering their time to be out there for that event is really the kind of um, the kind of behavior, the kind of action that's necessary to make those events really um, memorable and useful. So, uh, gentlemen, like I said before, one really thank you for for volunteering your time. Really thank you, Sergeant Travis, for your leadership. Um, you know, it, you know, it does. It's not lost on me that you've got a, a couple a couple of these gentlemen that were specialists are now corporal. Uh, that's usually uh, indicative of their own NCO leadership to see them continue to uh, to succeed and perform like that. And so these kind of volunteers are what uh, what what I think makes the Army great. So really appreciate it, gentlemen. Thanks for putting up with us. All right. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, we just got to recognize some younger servicemen. Now we get to recognize some older garrison folks. But we'll start with the youngest people first. So first up, Deputy Chief Jeremiah Irvin is being recognized for 25 years of length of service. Service beginning in March 26, 1997. Way to go, Deputy Chief. I was going to say, you, you, you carry it well. Oh, that's
Go ahead and talk. Hello. That's why. Go ahead and talk. Hello. Hello. Stay back. Apparently, we good to go, Joe. All right. So now we are in line for our question and answer segments, sir. Oh, perfect. Come on up, gentlemen. No, I ain't st standing up on the stage all by my own with, to get peppered by the tough questions. Everyone gets to join me. Sergeant Major, I didn't plan this. So, you know, don't, don't, uh, you saw my... So we're going to have Sergeant Major answer all the questions today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got through the heating and AC, and we got through the status of Reese Road. So I'll just start from the top. Uh, sir, you were, Mr. Foley, you were talking about personnel changes today and that there's a lot of new leadership coming in and out throughout the garrison. So what is leadership doing to ensure that our continuation of the mission and to make sure that we can still effectively communicate throughout the directorates? Yeah, so so um, thanks for that question. Couple of couple of points there. Communicating change down and in. Um, this is obviously one mechanism, one means uh, to do that, but um, it's been raised to me a couple of times that we need to also find other means and mechanisms to make sure that we're, um, you know, we're not waiting for the next uh, um, uh, commander's town hall to put the information out on change. So looking at other communication mechanisms, making sure that announcements are being put out, you know, through other means, you know, email chains, uh, communication through through staff calls and getting our battle with them. Adjusted, all those efforts um, we are looking at to make sure that we're communicating. New leaders are announced as they take position, not two months after, you know, at the next commander's town hall. So, um, got that. We're also working on overhauling uh, the new employee orientation program, so that not just you know, so leaders and all new employees are getting uh, the full overview process back online. Wes is doing a great job working on that. Uh, we're going to be uh, reestablishing new employee orientation briefings and um, looking at late May for the um, for the first reiteration of the new NEO uh, process. So working towards late May here um, for that. But yeah, loud and clear, we need to continue to improve all mechanisms of communicating change in leadership um down and in to the organization and we will do that yeah let me just add on to that just a little bit it, all good stuff and all things that are heading in the right direction right now um i will tell you a couple things i've been doing this for a few years now um you know just leading organizations for a few years now and i will tell you one consistent theme i've seen in every single organization that i've been a part of whether leading or a member of is uh, everyone is always says communications is a challenge and I don't say that because uh, I'm looking for the easy out. I say that because to illustrate the fact um, that communicate that communicating well is um, has to be a deliberate effort. It is it is a challenge if you don't. It's a challenge if you're not trying to make it happen every day. And realistically, I think I think back to some of the very first leadership lessons you learned as a young soldier. The first time they put you in front of in charge of a team and you got three other people. Uh, that, that are depending on you, one of the very first things they teach you is as soon as the squad leader tells you anything, you turn around and you tell your team that, right? I mean, that's the number one rule. So really the communication starts with every single supervisor out there, every single supervisor fighting to get information to their team, asking themselves who else needs to know about this. Um, and then every step above the, every next step on the leadership uh, rank, it's those people doing the same thing for their direct reports. Um, and, uh, and I mean, I will, I will tell you that, that it's a consistent theme amongst the, 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 the command group leadership as we split off into five different directions every day and we have our own separate sets of meetings. We have regular forums where we come to come together and we level bubbles. We're constantly um, tying each other into emails or uh, or back briefing each other on what goes on in meetings and stuff because having information is not power. 
sharing that information is where real power comes from and what, what, what makes that organization work well and it arms everyone with the information that they need in order to be successful in their job. So um, great question. And, uh, and, and, and I just, I really got to commend, you know, who else needs to know and supervisors fighting to get information down to their, down to the people that they supervise. Those are the keys to that success there. Thank you, sir. And, uh, you know, good news is, is I received about nine messages about the sound being out. So people are watching. Perfect. So, oh, See something, say something. There That's it good. is. Okay. This one is uh, a two-parter. Uh, came from basically a couple separate locations. But first, will there be a red, white, and blue celebration this year? And do we have any word about National Night Out? And that coming back to the fourth. Okay. So let me let me hit the first one first. I'm excited to tell everyone we are absolutely planning a 100% full execution of Red, White, and Blue Days on the 1st of July, which is the Friday, that four-day weekend. Um, Joe Pottles and the DFMWR team tell me that we've already put out the contracts for the fireworks, for bands, for stage, sound, and light. So everything is, is moving in that direction. I'm getting the first back brief on their concept plan tomorrow. Um, and so, yes, right now we are planning on moving full speed ahead on that. The only caveat I'll put it out there, and I still, you know, we may be done with COVID, but COVID's not done with us, is all of it is conditions dependent. Um, but if the conditions are similar to what they are right now or better, there's no issues. We're going to go full speed ahead with uh, red, white, and blue days. Now, Joe, have we talked about National Night Out? We haven't talked about it yet. Oh, I'm sorry, DES. And they all left because we got done awarding them, and so they all took off. <laughs> I see how it is. Okay, Dave Matsy, you out there? Um, we need to have a discussion about National Night Out, all right? So more to follow on that. Um, we Obviously, we haven't done it since I've been here um, because of COVID, but um, thanks for bringing that one up, and we'll take a look at it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next question. Do we still have to use the recovery review board for events? So for now, yes. Okay, that, that will be one of the things that we look at um, if we make the decision to transition to HPCon Alpha, that it will likely be one of the systems we may be able to suspend at that time. But right now, you know, the, I've said it to the residents multiple times, but I want to make sure I say it to, to the workforce is, you know, Masks were not the last mitigation measure to go away. You know, we still need to be thinking about, you know, there's still a number of mitigation measures in place, everything from, um, from physical distancing, hygiene, um, all those other mitigation measures, capacity limits, um, et cetera. And the recovery review board process is absolutely essential for us to ensure that those, that those elements that are holding, uh, holding events uh, in the garrison facilities or the garrison or utilizing the garrison assets have a plan to ensure that mitigation measures are in place. And that's really the purpose behind the recovery review board is making sure that we've got the right mitigations in play based on the conditions. And yep, right now we're in a low part where it's not very hard to meet that bar, um, but, it, but it's, it's a real state that has to be able to, we have to be able to change based on conditions. So um, we're still, we're still executing the recovery review board. Okay, and I saved the, the easiest one for the last from CYS. Uh, sirs, why doesn't our technology work? Sergeant Major. <laughs> <laughs> He's a signal guy, right? Uh, I, 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 I already answered the uh, answer. Uh, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, you, you <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, so I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I don't. I do not mean to make light of the frustrations that are in the workforce. Trust me, I hear you loud and clear. Um, and and um, Mr. Foley talked about it a little bit ahead of time. Um, I will tell you the questions I ask your leadership now about their technology challenges aren't what are the workarounds you've got in place or how are you making work? Because I know you are making it work. I know your leadership's helping you make it work. But that's not satisfactory to me, and I know that's not satisfactory to you. So the questions I'm asking them is, what are you doing about it? How many computers do you have? How many active tickets do you have at, um, at the LNEC? 
what's the age of those active ta- tickets? That's my expectation of your leadership on how closely they're tracking the technology issues that are occurring in the installation. I will tell you my assessment, and I'm no signal expert, um, and not to put you on the spot, sorry, I'm no signal expert, but I, th- I think we are seeing um, a number of factors all come together that are causing a number of our automation issues. First and foremost was um, there were a number of decisions made over the past few years to take risk in life cycle updates to, to the computers. When when the budget when the budget started really crunching us, um, we looked out and said, where do we have to spend money? And everyone's computers were working then, and we said we don't have to spend money there, so we're going to spend it someplace else. Um, unfortunately, what occurred in the intervening years is those computers continue to age, the programs and the stuff that we use continue to get continue to be getting better and start to use more resources from our computers, and now we've got older computers that are trying to run updated software that just break those computers. Um, and so that's what that's the importance of the lifecycle buy. Uh, that Mr. Foley was talking about earlier. And again, just like we've done with roads and uh, everything else, we have programmed in lifecycle buys from here all the way out through the FIDEP, and that is something that we are going to be continuing to do regardless of the financial situation. That's number one. Number two, we've got great teammates over in the LNEC. Unfortunately, they find themselves in a situation where they had a contract uh, expire um, without the contract being renewed. Um, so that has placed them in a situation where they've got a significant manpower um, issue in the LNEC in order to address our concerns. The third complicating factor is we're getting ready to go through a hugely important cybersecurity inspection. And like most of you know, when when we go through a cyber, when you go through any sort of inspection, what do you do? You go back and you clean up and you make sure everything's straight. Well, they're going back through the network and they're making sure everything's straight in the network and that clamp down on security is causing um, ripple effects as computers are getting kicked off the network more often. We're getting more pushes to our computers, which are straining already strained computers with more systems and processes that have to run on those computers. Um, And then the fourth, and this is really outside of even the LNEX control, is that you're seeing more patches and pushes coming down from above, um, from the highest echelons, coming all the way down from DISA. And occasionally we've seen where those systems and processes have conflicts that really break our computers. Um, The perfect one was about four or five months ago when computers were just locking up because the the, 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 the system that they'd pushed down was trying to run two processes at the same time, and those two processes had conflicts. And so it took a while for the LNEC to fix that. So the last thing I want to say about this, and, 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 and I understand this is, this is, this is little solace, um, but in today's day and age, especially as we see what's going on over in the Ukraine, especially as we see um, third party cyber actors on both sides of the fight over there, what it's important for each and every one of us to understand is every single one of our computers is literally the front line of cybersecurity. Um, if one of our computers doesn't have the right patches and still has vulnerabilities, if our printers still have firmware vulnerabilities. Those are all potential weaknesses and ways that people who want to work against our national interests can not only get into your computer or your printer, but can get access to the entire DOD network. Um, So while it's a little solace when you're trying to get the work done, understand the all the security measures are done with good intent to protect not only you and your work, this post and our work, but the entire DOD network and everything that the DOD is doing um, on a day-to-day basis. Um, so in a, in, not in a nutshell, in a very long way, a long-winded way, that's why I think we're having the uh, technology issues we're having right now. So that spinning wheel of death is really a spinning wheel of freedom. <laughs> the, the spinning okay. wheel of freedom. Nice, Chad. I love that. <laughs> and the only other comment I'll make to add to that is the, the 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 only other aspect that I can think of that the commander did not address was the other, you know, it was a 
a change that took place across the entire DOD at light speed when we went to A, the telework environment, and then B, the the immediate reaction to have to to have to field a capability to support that, which has resulted in the transition to to Microsoft 365 and the Microsoft 365 environment and you know what we are calling Army 365. That transition took place at absolute light speed from from you know a normal fielding process that takes place you know across the entire DOD and all services and, and, and DOD components were directed to assume you know to start using DOD 365 within like a six month period of time from like start to finish and and the impacts of that the adjustments to that uh, have a profound impact all the way down in particular the army as a, as the largest service having the largest footprint of the of the dode and the defense information infrastructure uh is just is huge and so all of the army chain from army cyber command to netcom to seven signal command to the uh, uh to 241st signal brigade to our local neck all of that in that chain is is reacting to that on a daily basis and trying to uh to adjust while at the same time defending the doden from 24 7 constant cyber attack and every time your computer has to reboot it's part of that defense and it's it's a it's a, an impact of cyber warfare which is constant and which is the primary fundamental element of what this installation is is functioning as an operational platform of 21st century warfare yes yeah, and, and hey, so we I think we did a we did a fairly decent job of answering the question you asked, which is why. I think the question you really wanted to ask is when's it going to get better? Um, and I will tell you right now, I don't know. I think we are on the right track to seeing improvements um, between the computer buy. Um, LNEX getting ready to execute their contracts, so they should see more people on board. Um, LNEX just went re recently went through a staff assistance visit, um, and they did pretty darn well. Um, so they're so they have been making a bunch of great strides in the local area security. Um, and then just like uh, Mr. Foley identified, um, I think the the higher echelons are figuring out what works and what doesn't work in the 365 environments etc so i don't know when you're you personally are going to see relief but i do think that um, collectively organizationally we are moving in the right direction um, and it will get better in time um, i know that's probably not satisfactory but that's what i have right now oh thank you sir um i did just get one question in you covered it a little bit earlier but maybe they missed but it's when are we going to fully open back up for employees to come back to work so many departments are fa failing to take care of service members and their families the world has opened back up so why haven't we um so let me take the last part of that question first and then i'll take the rest of the question so um if you remember during the height of COVID, I talked about priorities and I've talked about how the local government and the federal government, the Department of Defense all have our number one priority is to take care of our workforce, take care of our customers, take care of our people. Um, but after that number one priority, what you see quickly from local state government and uh, in the DOD is a deviation in our number two priorities. Number two priority generally for the local, the state government is the economy, making sure that everyone can earn a living um, and that that we can all get the goods and services that are necessary for us to to have functioning lives. That's their number two priority. Our number two priority in the military is to protect the mission, to protect those critical national security missions that occur here on post every day. So what that causes is that causes um, as as things get better, it causes us to move at a different speed than some of the local government does. Local government reopened fairly rapidly, and you're seeing that. You're seeing more, more things reopen in, even across the uh, entire country. The DOD is generally moving at a slower pace uh, because we don't have those pressures of the economy, and we still have to protect those national security measure, uh, those national security missions. That being said, um, they just did recently publish new guidance um, tying HPCon levels to 
um, to the local transmission levels. Right now, our local transmission level is low. However, over the past six weeks, those numbers have been increasing. Um, you know, it's the, it's the, what is it, the BA2, I've lost track, the BA2 variant that I think is coming through right now, and we're seeing the impact. The bad news of the BA2 variant, extremely transmissible. The good news of the BA2 variant is they're seeing fewer hospitalizations than ever before. So over the next two weeks, we're gonna, we've, we've watched six weeks of increasing transmission in the surrounding community. We're gonna continue to watch it for another two weeks. If we see that leveling off or tapering off or the rate of increase reducing, we will likely um, make the recommendation to the boss, to the senior commander that we move to HBCon Alpha. And when we move to HBCon Alpha is when you're gonna see, um, is when you'll see us be able to get back to full capacity or slightly less than full capacity in the workplace. Now, that being said, the first part of your question really cued in on me because you said that that service members are not getting services, okay? From the beginning, I've told all the managers and directors that I set service levels and you man to what you're required to in order to meet those service requirements. So if you, as a, as a member of a workforce down in a team, don't think that you're able to deliver the service that's required of you, that your boss required of you from your current situation, you need to have a conversation with that manager. You need to have a conversation with that supervisor uh, because I want, because uh, we should be at a point where we are, we are meeting the service level requirements that we need. We're delivering the services to our service members that we need to deliver for a long period of time, okay? Um, and, uh, and if we're not doing that, we need to know, um, and your leadership needs to know if you're not, if you're unable to do that. And we can look at adjustments and modifications on work schedules and work conditions on, on et cetera, uh, if we're not meeting that. Okay. I think I hit every aspect of that question. Yeah, absolutely did, sir. Um, that is the last questions that I have from the audience. Um, next on the schedule, I had Sergeant Major, uh, Sergeant Major with some words, if you're all right with that. Okay. Outstanding. So here's a closing comments. Everybody can hear me? Got it. All right. So first off, team, I just want to thank everybody for your dedication and commitment, right? So we just talked about a lot of different things that we've been, you know what I'm saying, caring for the installation over whole, um, over this, this COVID period. We talked about um, staff sections being undermanned. We got new hires on board and so forth. The one thing I've noticed in this, like, in this what, month and a half since I've been here at Garrison is we're in one of the most thankless jobs on the installation, right? We're in that customer service uh, job where all of our tenants, all of our family members that reside on this installation has a high expectation of us, right? And they do have a, I guess, perception that we are immune to the thing, to, to the community. They, they, there's a perception that we are immune to having hiring um, challenges. We are immune to ha having uh, uh, any of our teammates catch COVID and so forth, and we're not. Right, we have the same challenges that every other organization on the installation have when we start talking about computers and so forth. So I just want to thank you guys for being committed, you know what I'm saying, to the team, to to making sure that we are taking care of the service members uh, and the tenants organizations on the installation as best that we can. And then we continue to do that, right, with all of our challenges. And and I know some of the teammates that we have in different sections are going through extraordinary things because of extreme you know what I'm saying, manning issues where you may have only one person in the shop that particular week, you know, and we understand that. The one thing I ask of all of our teammates is, if you have different ideas, first off, don't assume that your direct supervisor sees and knows everything within your section that, that's going on. Um, and so when you see something or you know you need that additional help, say something, bring it up, you know what I'm saying, write in an ice comment. Right, and it, it's not just for the other members on the installation. It's for uh, all of us, right? So if you if you may have said that or mentioned something to a, a, a individual, and it seems like it may not be going anywhere, guess what? The commander and I see all ice comments. I know I do. I I comment on certain things, but either way, I just say we're here to help you guys, right? We're here to help the team. Our, our most important thing, and when it comes to Garrison, are you? Our teammates, if you're not taking care of how we're expecting you to take care of the force. Um, and so, again, I'm here to help. Um, uh, and I just end with thank you for all you've done and all you will continue to do. 
Hey, thanks, Sergeant Major. And extremely well said. I mean, I haven't, I probably haven't said this enough lately, but um, the only reason MCOM works is because of the people. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is the only way MCOM works is because of each and every one of you, your dedication to taking care of soldiers, your dedication to mission accomplishment, your dedication to doing right uh, by every member of this community. And, uh, and, and absolutely, um, our, everyone up here's job, real role is to equip you and empower you and to, uh, and to make sure that you have everything that you need in order to be able to everything that we can afford to give you to make sure that you're capable of, of, of executing the missions we ask of you. Um, and you are at the point where you have more knowledge of how of your job and your job accomplishment than anyone else does. So I see the PAO guys getting a little bit nervous because I think we're running up against time here. So uh, did you have anything that you want to finish out with? No, thank you all. Okay, so the very last thing I'll tell you is um on monday if you are an af or a naf employee you're going to be re receiving a link for our command climate survey so if you remember the last one we did was about a year ago and so this is your opportunity to uh, uh provide feedback um to the garrison leadership on how things are going in your directorates and uh and i would just ask um we we spent a lot of time thinking about this one because we we were we were aware about a year ago we put you through a lot of surveys in a short period of time and there was a lot of survey fatigue so it's been about a year since we've done a survey of the of the workforce um i just just ask each and one every one of you to participate let your voice be heard write in comments you know uh answer those questions truthfully um you know you can tell us about the state of the garrison team better than anyone else and we want to hear it from you so please fill out the survey please encourage your workmates and your teammates to fill out the survey um, and if you're a, a supervisor manager or leader out there please encourage your team uh, to fill out the survey so with that um kirk's retirement yes next tuesday right yeah. next tuesday 10 30 at club meet okay so we'll be saying goodbye to Kirk Fetcher uh, next Tuesday, 1030 at Club Mead. Everyone's invited. I would really love to see us show off Kirk in a, in a manner commiserate with his service to this uh, to this installation. Um, he's been a he's been a stalwart member of this team for a very long time. And uh, and I'm looking forward to sending him off in style. So um, thank you very much. Um, and the last thing that I will leave us with and close us with today is uh, is is generally how I started. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for bringing great teammates. Cool. Well, we'll be back in June for the next commander's call. Other than that, we will be sending the link. We apologize for the sound issues, but we'll be sending a link out to your directors to, so that you can rewatch if necessary. And please keep your questions coming. We're, we're answering questions all the time. Good night. Afternoon. <laughs>